This is Create the Next from Pro CFO Partners, where every week we explore strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help today's businesses put their financial picture in context. Welcome back to Create the Next. I'm Chris Bentliff, and I have with me the CEO of the whole show, Nelson Tepfer, uh, CEO Pro CFO Partners. Nelson, what a week. Uh, as you and I are having this conversation in mid March, Silicon Valley Bank went belly up. Uh, all of a sudden, over the weekend, people are talking about banking crises in ways that we haven't in you know 15 years. It's been a whole thing. It's changing everybody's mood about the economy. It's asking lots of questions about a lot of different things. I want to get your take on it. What do you think we should be paying attention to, especially if we're maybe small or mid-market business runners or executives or founders? What should we be taking from it from a, a more conceptual perspective? A crisis in general, problems in general, money management in this case, uh, maybe in general. Just Let's just lay it out and kind of pick this apart a little bit. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for having me back on. Always and get, I always enjoy our conversations when you and I get a chance to speak around these topics. So this banking one is always a fascinating for us. My first reaction when we start hearing the news about it is, like yourself, like, didn't we put this to bed 15 years ago? Like, wait, I'm surprised that we're still having a conversation like this now. You know, Silicon Valley was one here in the greater New York area. Signature was another very big one. It affected yeah. many, many companies. You know, they were a very business friendly bank in a good way, not in any way that got them in trouble with what actually happened with them, but they were a very business friendly bank with their approach and how they worked with their clients. And so we definitely had some clients who, who banked with both institutions. And uh, not only did we get those kind of phone calls, the frantic phone calls across our client base, you know, over the weekend, but many other clients were calling us frantically because they weren't sure what would happen next with regards to their own bank accounts. Right. It leads to a ton of uncertainty and speculation and confusion and frustration. It does. Oh, that's for sure. It does. And the fallout, I, feel, I still believe, is ongoing. You know, not that this is actually happening per se, but, the, you know, what does that mean for them when they start setting up their new bank accounts? How many different banks should they start banking with and what does that look like for their side of things? So we'll start with the first aspect of it, the reaction to what's going on. So, you know, as this was happening, as soon as we obviously heard the FDIC step in, then it became, OK, you know, you don't need to do anything today. That's OK. Your money is safe. You're not going to lose all the money. But it becomes how do you respond to this rapid change in environment or how you do business? And for some companies, they said, no, it's fine. My money's going to be safe. We can stay where it is and see what happens. And our approach has been, yes, but you also need to make sure that you're prepared for if this doesn't actually move in a direction that everybody's comfortable with. So it gets on the contingencies and mitigations kind of stuff that we've talked about before, which is presume the road will be smooth, but re be, make sure you've got your big tires in case it gets a little bit rough. So what is some yeah. of that advice that you're sharing without you know feeling like we got to hold ourselves accountable to all kinds of things we can't control? What's some basic sort of common sense, smart things to do? So it starts with yeah, obviously understanding your actual immediate cash needs. So what are your what do your cash flow forecasts look like? Make sure those are up to date for what you really need to be doing day to day. And where do you then keep the money that funds those immediate cash needs becomes the next conversation to it. So while many, many, many small to mid-sized companies may have more than one banking relationship, some do just have one. So it becomes where are you keeping that money so you can actually you know, meet your own obligations, you know, both to your external vendors and also to your employees. You know, they ran into this issue where it became big news that, you know, one of the big payroll companies was using, you know, Silicon Valley Bank to process payroll through. And they had to, you know, switch that very quickly over the weekend, obviously, to another larger institution. So it's understanding your current obligations becomes extremely important. And understanding how those current obligations are going to be funded over the immediate future is, is a crucial key to making sure that you can meet those obligations you have to. Which introduces all kinds of new conversations. And one of those is just an element of complexity to your banking relationships. I think a lot of businesses, well, you tell me, you certainly have more experience with it, but it's really nice to feel like this is my bank or this is my mostly bank, you know, and especially these are the, this is the local place that I can go in and shake a hand. And that stuff still matters when it comes to something as, I don't know, can make us feel vulnerable talking about money. So I don't know. Do you, what's your advice there? Do I kind of put all my, all my payroll eggs in this one and all my, <laughs> operations in that one or is it that easy or cut and dried or what so you know look 
For the most part, many of our clients definitely bank with the smaller regional banks. We find them to be very much, very, you know, quite a bit more, I'll call it business friendly to some institutions rather than some of the largest, not because larger banks are bad in any way, shape or form. Just they very often cater and how they make money and their profits are generated from a different kind of stream of income rather than you know, catering to the small middle market. So in that instance, we actually like very often regional banking and regional banking relationships for that direct, for, for exactly what you just described. The interesting thing part that comes about is, you know, obviously just what happened over this weekend is, yes, they were really, really good on their banking relationships and how they supported businesses. But what we never <laughs> know is how exposed they were to other things that happened. And suddenly you get that phone call to like, oh, yeah, by the way, you know, Signature was taken over by the FTC, by the FDIC. And it's like, okay. We have all these clients with signature, and then the phone call started, and everybody started scrambling and what this actually means for them and answering all the calls and dealing with that. So it became that quick game of you know reassuring everybody that yes, they'll still be able to operate. This is what it means for them and how they'll actually play out. But to your point, you know, look, a bank is an incredibly powerful partner, and I use that word very carefully to grow in companies. Yeah. They should be your partner. So you want to be working with banking institutions that work with your kind of company, that will recognize the potential that you have, that will give you the right facilities you need to continue to grow. Now, there are many, 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 many banks out there. I think at the moment I have joked with people, well, semi-joked with people. I think at the moment I know about 216 business bankers, but there are only a handful of them I actually recommend to clients. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing your banker becomes key. The litmus test we often talk to our clients about is, do you have your banker's cell phone number? If not, there's something wrong with your banking relationship. And that really shows when it gets shaken, like something like this. You know, there, you know, we have the, many of the bankers we know. I was speaking to them on Sunday when all this was happening, not during business hours, not during this. I was picking up the phone saying, hey, what's going on over here? What are you seeing? What are you hearing about these types of conversation about what's currently going on? And some of these are at the relationship vice president level. Some of these are at the market executive level where we're able to pick up the phone and place that phone call to them. And that becomes really important in being that right partner to support you know, a growing company. You're touching on something that is crucial, which is this kind of attitude of partnership in general. I'm going to extend it. What a relief, if nothing else, a relief that your clients had somebody to pick up the phone and talk to about this. Because even if it's like, I don't have any news, I don't know any more than you do, but at least we can commiserate on this, like what is happening at the same time. And maybe somebody can say, let me make some calls or let me leverage this other relationship I have, or let me introduce you to this person. I think that that uh, those relationships and that network always feel important, but boy, when the rubber meets the road, they are no. literally life preservers. They are a thing that can put you to, okay, I can at least sleep tonight. Talk to me a little bit about that, the value of that, even for you being able to pick up the phone on a Sunday and call these bankers and just have an organic, real, authentic conversation about this stuff. It's pretty important. No, it really is. And it goes both ways. You know, the banking partners that we have, the relationships that we have with them, this is why we recommend them to clients. It doesn't, it doesn't help us in any way, shape or form if they use one bank over another, but we recognize the value in those kind of bankers and relationships and how they do business with their clients, how they support their clients. And if it's aligned with the way we're supporting our clients, then obviously we want our clients to work with them because we know they're going to provide them the service and be there for them when they need them. So we look for those kind of bankers, and it's not always specific to an institution. I know we, we know bankers at almost every institution who operate this way. Sometimes it is more the banker individually rather than the institution they represent. But the interesting thing, which is just starting to come out a little bit more now, is the loan facility, the deals, the lines of credit, the things like that that were in the, you know, what does that mean for for the other banks that are now, you know, while I think at the moment they're saying it's all business as usual. I find it very hard to believe that underwriting is not going to be sharpening their pencils just to make sure around some of these pieces. And what does that mean for all these companies that are in the middle of exploring what those kind of things are, whether it's, you know, a company looking to buy out, a, you know, one owner trying to buy out its partner or whether it's, you know, so a company looking for a line of credit so they can take on larger jobs. These are some factors that should really come into play. And for me, perhaps even bigger picture than that, I mean, you and I have chatted about this that, you know, whether we choose to use the word, the, refer the word recession, I know I have joked about that. We don't longer do that because that's become apparently a political term rather than an economic one. But whether we choose to say we are in a recession, we're heading for a recession, it's here, hard landing, soft landing, no landing, whatever we choose to say, we're definitely seeing some, even before all this happened, we've been seeing some, we'll call it slowdown in activity almost across the board. And we get to see this across all the different types of clients that we work with. So we get to see the full economic cycle. 
when something like this happens that shatters the confidence of people having there, there's a ripple effect beyond just what does it mean whether you can write a check out of this bank account or not. There's a ripple effect throughout the whole economy of what this means and how we do business. How do I keep my wits about me? I mean, how do I how do I be that? I, I was reading an article here, and I'm in San Diego, and, and you're across across um, America, but there, we had a startup founder here who had tens of millions of dollars in the bank at Silicon Valley Bank, and he he's a CEO, and he's on the phone and on the computer trying to get tens of millions of dollars out of there. He was lucky and was able to do it. He didn't find out until Saturday morning that his you know his transaction went through, but this creates a ton of stress. Uh, upstream. So am I going to get my paycheck? Asks the you know rank and file employee, which is going all the way through the CFO, through the C-suite, into the CEO's you know, uh, cell phone um, on a Sunday. What do I do? Thankfully for those, you know, those questions have been answered at this point. Is that yeah. essentially whether they've admitted it to it or not, essentially the way the FDIC structured and stepped in after signature, they're essentially guaranteeing all deposits with no limits across every bank. Because at this point, they they stepped in after signature because they were worried about the entire banking system. But essentially by them stepping in like that, demonstrating that, no, we're not going to let any other banks go. And yes, we're going to guarantee all depositors. They're essentially saying all deposits everywhere are safe. So it's recognizing that fact that. over we here. Can take, we can take a breath on that, but it it introduces, uh, I guess, as we were talking about, what's your what's the strength of your relationships? Maybe that's one of the takeaways here: is what's the strength of your relationships, and do they need to be strengthened? Yeah. No, that's definitely a really important one. Another one is the crisis management aspect, which, you know, for many companies, this was a crisis. Thankfully, for many of them, it wasn't, but it really gave a lot of companies pause to think, okay, what do I do now? Or how should I do this? And it becomes, from our perspective, it becomes that clarity. Let's, let's break this down. You know, you have to go down back to basics. Start your immediate needs. What does cash flow look like? What does this actually look like for your company as you move forward over the next short period of time? But that clarity of the planning for what you're working on in your company becomes really important as well, because there are some companies that are facing opportunities now as a result. Mm -hmm. Oh, this changed over here. And now what do we do? Or we were thinking about doing this. Does this change our mindset? Or if we were going to invest, should we continue to invest or not? And the answer may change to no right now, but it's recognizing what the impact of these decisions are. Don't let them be just reactive. Like, oh, no, this happened. Shut it down. Shut everything down. We're not doing anything. We stick our head in the sand and hope everything goes away. It becomes getting really clear what you as your company and your leader are working towards so you can define what the decisions you need to make over this next period of time and how has the last how have the events of the past week impacted those decisions that's that's such a useful point of view nelson and i'm thinking about one of our conversations earlier in the year where we talked about let's let's have a, a rock solid you know kind of goals and strategies around it when something like this comes up uh I'm going to say in context, we should be able to put this in context of our larger goals and strategies, right? So it might be a shock to the system. It might be a surprise. It might be a crisis, but we should still be able to make sense of it. And that clarity that you referenced that we spoke about earlier becomes really important because then you can make some of those conversations, you know, the, the questions become binary. Does this impact the, my goals? Yes or no. And Do I need to change what I'm doing? Theory. Yes or no. Exactly yes. right. And the answer for some of them can be yes. It's not like all oh, the answer needs to be no and keep your head down and keep moving forward. You have to look at it. You have to revisit it when you when you get a shock to the system like this. Because again, aside from just the actual banking, the mechanics of that, of will your checks clear next week or not? What is the impact this will have, which no one can really say with any degree of certainty, the actual impact this will have on the economy as a whole, that what the shock to the system did. You know, again. There are some who will say this was teetering beforehand. There are some who will say it was strong beforehand, but no one can accurately tell you today, oh, because of this, now this is going to happen. But you have to be prepared for what may happen as a result. You know, if we look back at the last five years, there's a whole pile of nobody saw that coming, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, and at some point we should probably be able to say, you know, let's we can't see what's coming, but let's make sure we've got binoculars next to us anyway. You know? <laughs> Absolutely true. And that goes back to where we you know what we chatted about earlier this year. That clarity becomes important. The relationships you have, who you can lean on in the crisis becomes really key. Again, we've got calls from numerous clients. We even got calls from a number of prospects. I told any bankers, if you have people you know bombarding you with questions, they just want someone to talk to about this, feel free to put them in touch with us, regardless of clients, not clients, potential clients or not. There's there's this fear going on over there that if we can help with, 
even if it's just having a five, 10 minute conversation with somebody, just let them know how this works or what this means for them. We're happy to do so. And we've, you know, some of them have taken us up on those offers and we've had numerous conversations. Obviously our clients call us, sure. Some prospects call us great, but we've had conversations with people who will never be our clients. And we're just happy to be of assistance to the entrepreneurial community as a whole. I mean, let's extend that to our, our listeners and our viewers uh, in this moment. Find us at ProCFOPartners.com and let's let's see, you know, if, if you just need somebody to sit with for a minute, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, of course. Always happy to help. Nelson Tepfer is the CEO and co-founder over there at ProCFO Partners. Uh, always such a great conversation. I always look forward to 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 them as as we get to spend this time together. And you're so generous with your expertise and your insights. And we're all valuing that uh, in situations like this. Thanks, Nelson. It's good to be with you. Thank you, Chris. Always enjoy our conversations. Thanks. Thanks for watching. And a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Visit ProCFOPartners.com for more strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help you put your business's financial picture in context.